Yes, Sea Search, led by the Marine Conservation Society, delivered in partnership. Lara is Isle of Man Sea Search. Who else is here? George is going to Sea Search. We are, we are a, a, a network. I'm going to talk very, very quickly, like I normally do, and hopefully briefly, which I normally don't, because I'm the warm up act for animals. 35 years of sea search, not quite as long as the, uh, the Manx Wildlife Trust, but you know, we're working on it. <coughs> Way back, this is, this is the late 70s, the history of sea search is kind of the history of marine conservation, diving, all of that tangled together. David Bellamy, Underwater Year of Conservation, 1977. Underwater Conservation Society became the Marine Conservation Society. Professional surveys. Um, this was the Nature Conservancy Council. Lots of, lots of acronyms which have all changed. You know, Land Rovers and Squidgies in the Outer Hebrides. It's brilliant. Um, and a boat on Papal Westray, which was the professionals doing what was the JNCC led Marine Nature Conservation Review from the late 80s into the early 90s, but 90s. There was a sort of a volunteer aspect of that, led by the Marine Conservation Society. And that kind of metamorphosed into sea search, being more organised, if you like. Um, in 2003, the Marine Conservation Society got a lot of money from the Heritage Lottery Fund, the National Lottery Fund over in the UK, and they hired a national coordinator in, in the form of Chris Wood, who many of you may know, have met, remember. I know Sue was very involved back in those early years, in the early 2000s. So when that national coordinator was in post, it became a lot more organised. There was a steering group. It had statutory nature conservation bodies, so the people we were trying to influence, diving organisations, the or, uh, National Archaeology Society, all the people who we thought might have volunteers to get involved set up formal partnerships with wildlife trusts to deliver the partnership program um, and then set up this network of regional coordinators throughout the British Isles. So Britain, Ireland, everywhere. Here in the Channel Islands, the Isle of Man, it's all. It's not really a national coordinator, it's international coordinator, international rescue. Um, and a formal training program was developed at that time taking those horrible, horrible MNCR forms and trying to make them slightly simpler so we didn't completely scare the volunteers with all the horrible paperwork to do. Um, so we've got the entry-level sea search observer and then you go on and you can become a sea search surveyor. So that was Chris. 2016, Chris decided that he needed to retire because he was, he was <laughs> he'd done it for 13 years at that point and he thought, I'd come in and have more energy and bring a new... <laughs> A new approach to sea search, which mostly involves talking quickly and waving my arms around, not dressed as an octopus. Mm -hmm. So there's me. I live on Portland in Dorset, which is about 85 miles directly north of here. It's nearly an island, um, and that's me at Chesil Cove. I, am a, I was a sea search volunteer before I became a regional coordinator and then national coordinator. That's me and Chris at Bovy, ghost of, Chris, of sea search past and present. Um, filling in a sea search for the dive, you'd be pleased to see. So it's all built on volunteers. That's the thing about sea search. It's data collection, but it's using volunteers. And that's us going out and doing sea search everywhere and eating cake afterwards. Cake figures, figures largely. We've been pushing snorkeling. It was always believed that sea search was just the divers. Now, the only thing about sea search is it needs to be in the sea. Sea search. As long as it's in the sea, near the sea, it's all good. So we pushed snorkelling, particularly during the COVID years, when you know technically we weren't supposed to go diving. So we really we were pushing people to get involved through snorkelling. It's much more accessible. You can get to places with just a snorkel far more easily within all that gubbins as a diver. And you can see that it is it's starting to ramp up. We're starting to make sea search more accessible to people through snorkelling, and it's great fun. And the seagrass, it's just nice and shallow. So what have we done with all those volunteers in the past 35 years? We're looking at changing distributions, possibly. Um, I was very excited to see a coma in Jersey, uh, in Guernsey last September. They're now in Devon. Um, oh, that hasn't quite come out, has it? It's a bit dark. Needed to look out for these little Norway bullhead, little tiny little scorpion fish, which now we're looking seem to be everywhere. First records, either UK first records, British Isles first records, maybe, you know, um, that one was a, a UK first record. Pinkston, 
can we strike flat work? Amazing. Just normal people, normal divers using their hobby. And generating a mountain of data, a proper mountain. Look, it's nearly a million tax on records on the NBN hours, all freely available in the public domain under this CC BY license. So volunteers collecting it and giving it to anybody to use, because there's no point collecting it if you don't use it as ammunition. Um, and as you can see, it's pretty much everywhere. Not the Bristol Channel, nightmare. <laughs> Morecambe Bay, again, a bit of a nightmare to dive in. So, a mountain of data, but what are we going to do with it? In 2018, the end of 2018, I persuaded the MCS that what we needed was a data officer to actually do something with it, not just collect it and pile it up. And that's where Angus comes in. Ta-da! Angus is going to tell you what we're doing with the data. That was quite quick, wasn't it? Well, that was Thank you, Charlotte. Um, the president of the Associate uh, has it absolutely on the money. We do have the capability of making change, and as Charlotte just pointed out, part of that change requires data, and using data in a sensible way, making it available, uh, cataloguing it, curating it, and applying kind of modern approaches to interpreting and interrogating data. So, yes, absolutely, we do have it, but a lot of that capacity is based on having that underlying data available. So I'm just going to quickly skip through some of the more recent developments that we've applied to the C-Search data set over the last three or four years, covering our website, interactive apps, um, a training dashboard for our coordinators to understand a bit more about the behaviour of our volunteers, their progress and development through the scheme, a little bit about the centralised data set where our data are stored, and some of the advantages of updating the, the format in which that's done. And uh, at the end, hopefully, uh, I'll have a bit of time to talk about um, a very uh, recent uh, release of uh, the State of Nature report and some associated studies with that. Um, I may have to skip over some of that at the end if I run out of time, but I'd be quite happy to chat with anyone about kind of the possibilities and opportunities that those approaches might, uh, might provide um, amongst us all. So on our, our updated new shiny website, which was very long overdue, we have a couple of little interactive tools that are very much targeted at the volunteers. Um, if you want to try and plan your survey to go out and figure out the best place to, to go and do your, uh, your dive or your snorkel to collect information that's valuable, all broken up into grid squares and you can assess whether nobody's been there before, in which case new data would be very, very welcome. Uh, Blue squares are places where we've had at least two years of surveys in the past. Okay, great to get data from there, but perhaps less valuable. And the red squares are where we have only one previous visit, um, and those data cannot yet contribute into statistical models. Uh, if you go there for a second visit, then that then releases those data to be included in, in models, and they have really, really big value. So it's um, zoomable, scalable, you can click in the uh, buttons to find out how many visits and what species were found there. So it's really, really interactive and you can get loads of information to help guide where you go and uh, do your next bit of work. There's also kind of backwards looking uh, tools where you can interrogate your own records. So I've used Charlotte as an example here. This is uh, the kind of automated plot of all our dive positions over the last uh, 20 years, I think. Um, you can then filter that through to be uh, particular spatial area by a particular individual. So that's Charlotte's records from, uh, from Guernsey and, uh, and Sark. And then if you look at, you can filter that down again to be a specific taxon. And so there's one blue sponge record of, uh, of the East Coast of Guernsey. It's a really, really nice way to say, right, okay, let's see what there was and who found it and, and where was it. This is some of the stuff that's still really a bit uh, um, clumsy and ugly, but this is our uh, volunteers dashboard where we could look in and say, okay, how long does it take the typical person to do some training? Who are the people that have started their training but haven't yet completed it? Who are the people that have completed it but not yet submitted forms or have done loads and loads of forms? So it gives us a good way to target individuals to give them additional support um, or to give them recognition for, for doing really, really well. 
Um, hopefully it'll be a bit more pretty and uh, beautiful by the time I've finished it. But this is now a, a work in progress. As always, volunteers are really concerned about what happens to the data. Does it doesn't just go into a big black hole to disappear? And hopefully we can come up with a very convincing argument that that's not the case. Historically, it went into the old marine recorder, the hideous access database that we can now consign to the scrap heap of, uh, of history. Um, and we have a now shiny new a lot of software mechanisms behind it are, but it's all very, very cutting edge, um, very comprehensive. It overcomes all the uh, pitfalls and hiccups and difficulties with the old system. Um, and it is now a truly a proper spatial database. So you can say, right, draw a box around this area, extract all the records from it. Um, you can see where your dives occur in relation to other people's dives. You can make sure that all your samples are occurring in the same place where they should be. So it's really interactive. You get lots of feedback as you're actually entering the data, ensuring its robustness, its, its reliability, which is so important for credibility um, to external partners. Um, there will be uh, an aspect that the data enters, the people managing the data are access, but it will also be a publicly available front end that anyone can create an account, log in to access these data in their entirety, not just the species records that you get through the National Biodiversity Network. Uh, so there'll be a front end that will be queryable. You can design a little query to say, right, okay, I want these species by this person from, from, from this place. Or you can say, oh, I want a whole lot, I want to download a database. <laughs> if you're familiar with working with <coughs> you can take a whole spatial light snapshot and uh, export that for, for your own um, so, still in development, the reporting tool, but um, in the next 10, 12 months, uh, it, it should all be freely available for people to use. Don't worry about it too much for that. And, of course, for, for some preferring data in a nice flat spreadsheet rather than a database, there's still always the export of Excel available to as well. So, aiming to make it fully uh, uh, accessible to as many people as, as possible. Historically, that hideous old access database manually updated twice, sometimes only once a year with data sets, very laborious processes to pass that data on to higher level portals. Um, now with this new system with APIs and computers talking directly to computers, uh, we're having nightly updates. So every time somebody puts a new bit of data in the next day, that data will be immediately available to uh, um, to the public front end. There are automated links to those ongoing portals. So data in Marine Recorder will automatically go to the Data Archive at the Marine Biological Association. It will automatically go to the National Biodiversity Network, cutting out all those hideous, time-consuming, error-prone processes that uh, we had to struggle through before. So for people like me, this is uh, an absolute lifesaver. Brilliant stuff. OK. Um, and once we've got all that data, we obviously don't want to be just leaving it in a database. We want to make use of it, interrogate it, answer interesting questions. And I spent quite a lot of time over the last two or three years trying to adopt, modify, develop approaches by which we can take those data in order to be able to provide really, really valuable and interesting um, outputs that then can be used to uh, support lobbying, support uh, conservation management and action and to uh, convince people that things are going on, stuff is happening. So you may have heard previously of the State of Nature report, which is a multi-partner report that comes out every three years. Uh, the third one was released at seven o'clock last night, so you may well be seeing it featuring in the media and in social media over the next few days. Um, for the first time, we've been able to include benthic species in the population trends section of that. So it has lots of butterflies, lots of beetles, lots of plants, lots of birds, lots of mammals, never before anything to do with the marine seabed. So now we have uh, summary information about 430 benthic marine species um, included in the state of nature, which I think is massively exciting. And um, there's room for development and improvement. It's a kind of early days yet approach um, for our data set, but uh, 
really, really quite sexy and funky thing to do. Um, uh, but that means that if we have specific questions about population trends, we can say, right, okay, for this area, if we have enough records, we can look at that, uh, that trajectory of how that population has been doing through time. We can see, is it nice and steady? If we look at seagrass, we can see bumbling along at a very, very small percentage across the UK or for individual, individual countries. The species like crawfish, uh, we have a really, really happy story um, where there's been a really big increase since about 2014, 2015 in the occupancy. That's basically the, the, the geographic range that the, the species occurs on. So there's been big recovery in the population. Um, we published quite a nice little paper a couple of years back about that, that process. Um, and there is just huge scope for uh, answering similar questions or providing similar sorts of analyses for species of interest, uh, provided they are encountered by sea search divers in su suitable numbers and you have a big enough area, then we can start um, uh, at least taking this approach. Um, and there's no reason why it has to be restricted to benthic species. It could be adopted by um, if there's a suitable data set, we're going to hear lots about data sets over the next couple of days. Um, there's no reason why the similar sort of approach couldn't be adopted for other habitats and ecosystems. So I love this sort of stuff. I am uh, a self-admitted um, data nerd, and this sort of stuff works in my boat. So uh, um, if anybody else is interested in it, quite happy to, to talk over the, the, the next day or so. Uh, yeah, so you, you can do it at different spatial scales. It doesn't have to be the whole of the, the, the British Isles and adjacent seas. You can zoom in, but there are limits to how far you can take it. You can't do it for my little patch of seabed next to uh, next to the quayside. There, there has to be a big enough area to provide adequate numbers of records to make the the software models, uh, the, sorry, the statistical models work. So, the value of uh, Sea search, I like to think of it as being absolutely massive. Huge, huge possibilities. Um, and that's not just about the really rare species, the, the quirky species, the new arrivals, although that is also valuable. But the value from Sea search is because it collects information about everything, it allows you to have these really powerful models. And that means it's important to keep recording stuff about the common species. There's always criticism about nobody records dandelions or rabbits because they're seen everywhere. But if you do, then you can use that to add power to your interpretations about other species as well. And sea search is so valuable because it has those common species in there alongside everything else. And it provides all the context, the habitat, the substratum, what the type of seabed was. It's a really big data set for, for the marine environment. This is a huge thing. It's not as big as the continuous plankton recorder data set, but it is enormous. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and it's a good long time series. Some of our records go back to 1977, mostly from about 2003 onwards. But that's still 20 years worth of, of good solid data collected in a consistent way with robust quality control. So uh, um, it's, it's a really valuable thing. Yeah, if you want to know more, come and speak to us, check out our website, get involved. Um, great to see more and more people. We're expanding more to include snorkeling uh, as much as we can. It's tidal walks even if you're wanting to go and uh, see what's living underneath the seabed, uh, underneath the seaweed on the shore. There's no reason why that can't be included in sea search as well. So we've got a fabulous new data set. We're exploiting it, interrogating it, interpreting it with new digital tools and statistical methods. Those data are being kept and managed and curated in a robust new system that's allowing many, many new and interesting applications. So we're always going to encourage recording um, and always interested in finding and hearing new ways to, to make use of the data. So a very big thank you to Sue for the invitation to come speak today. And of course, biggest thank you of all to all the volunteers that spend their time collecting the data because without that, there's, there's nothing. Um, and thank you very much for, uh, for listening. Um, happy to take any questions at the end um, or, or afterwards. Thank you.